Oh, I have to write this down. <clears throat> Yes, it is a lot of, comp of stuff that we have to go through. And so let's get started. A lot of stuff that, you know, that I have trouble with. And whether he likes to admit it or not, Tom, whatever his name is. I keep on wanting to call him Tom Chaney, but that's a character from uh, True Grit. Anyway. So, yes, let's begin, though, shall we? And, Mr. Arlinghouse, this one's for you. We're going to go backwards a little bit, end up with the feminist movement, begin with the feminist movement, rather. So, Europe's most advanced feminist movement was in Great Britain. A lot of you guys can basically go through this. Horton, you've already talked about it. Uh, I do find it fascinating, though. Millicent Fawcett led the moderate National Union of Women's Suffrage Society. Remember we talked about how the problem with the feminist movement was that it was splintered, that they couldn't agree upon A, what they wanted, and B, how they wanted to get it. So Millicent Fawcett led this moderate movement. She believed that Parliament of England would grant women the right to vote only if it, the Parliament, were convinced that they, the women, the feminist movement, would be respectable in their politics. No burning down post offices. These were the English liberal tactics. Emmeline Pankhurst, however, took another route. Emmeline Pankhurst was an Irish woman, and she adopted many of the Irish methods of resistance to the English in her movement. She and her daughters, Christabel and, wait for it, wait for it, Mr. Ellinghouse, and Sylvia, that's her on the side of a pub in London, Mr. Arlinghouse, uh, demonstrating for the right to vote. Uh, these women were rough customers. Yeah. As it says there, they were, uh, they founded the Women's Social and Political Union. Uh, they used violence. They were derisively known as suffragettes and lobbied for the right to vote. By 1910, they turned to violent acts, arson, breaking windows, and sabotage of postal boxes. And as we talked about before, uh, Mr. Arlinghouse, that little video that I sent you might come in handy now. Because one of the things they did to resist being broken was that after being incarcerated, they would resort to hunger strikes. Their, prison, their prisons... Uh, the the uh, authorities in the prison would resort to a unique method to break that hunger strike. And Ms. Darling House, you can cue the video now. British women, however, received the right to vote in 1918 as a result of their participation in World War I. Many British women participated in World War I as nurses and other things to help the war effort. And because of that, they were given the right to vote. Uh, including the participation of one, Edith Clavell, Mr. Arling. I'm not Clavell. I'm so dumb. You know, ever since I discovered this woman back in 2013. Yeah, Mr. Arling, look. See this statue? This statue uh, is one of the many statues that surrounds Trafalgar Square in the center of London. And it honors this woman, Eliz uh, Elizabeth Clavell, not Clavell. I thought it was Clavell. She was a British nurse served in um, that served uh, for the Amer for the Red Cross International Red Cross in Belgium. Now here's what's odd about her: she actually got in trouble at first in the Red Cross station because she would treat German prisoners with the same level of care as she treated British prisoners. And of course, the British officers were really not happy with that, particularly with the shortage of supplies and whatnot. Well, then this outpost gets overran by the Germans. Uh, and, um, of course, Edith Cavell is there. But they allow her to continue doing what she's doing. Well, one of the things she did was that she set up an underground, or she was instrumental in setting up an underground, whereby British wounded prisoners were allowed to escape into neutral Netherlands, where they would then be transported across the English Channel and to freedom. And the Germans found out about it, and they shot her. 
it created an international outcry, an international incident, but it's, hey, it's war. Yes, but on the night, the night before she was to be executed for espionage, she wrote these famous last words. Cavell Horton. Well, look what she says. Patriotism is not enough. I must have no hatred or bitterness for anyone. She wrote those words the night before she was going to be executed. Uh, you know, now that is courage. And yeah, so British women were given the right to vote on the heels of World War One. So, ah, um, British women were ahead of their game uh, of women of the, on the continent. In other words, they got the right to vote and got political uh, rights before their counterparts on the rest of the continent did. France, in France, um, Hubertine Auclair began campaigning for the vote in France. In 1901, the National Council of French Women was organized, but did not support the vote for women for several years. French Roman Catholic feminists, such as Marie Maguet, supported the right to vote. Notice, though, unlike in Britain, almost all French feminists rejected any form of violence. However, on the other hand, it was not until after World War II that women in France received the right to vote. Fact of the matter was, it wasn't until the 1970s in Switzerland that women received the right to vote. Yeah. Um, you say, well, what about the United States? The United States granted, granted the right to vote. Thank you, Iron, iron Jawed Angels. Right, Mr. Arlinghouse? Um, 1919, Woodrow Wilson succumbed. Uh, he uh, gave women the right to vote. Uh, he supported it, and therefore the uh, 19th Amendment was passed. In 1894, the Union of German Women's Organization, um, Bundesdeutsche uh, Female, okay, I, I, I give up, was founded, and by 1902, it was campaigning for the right to vote. Women received the right to vote in Germany in 1918, but as a part of the Weimar Republic's constitution. Um, the Weimar Republic, Mr. Arlinghouse, that's the first time we've mentioned that, isn't it? The Weimar Republic, as Mr. Arlinghouse can tell you all, is the democratic government that was established in Germany uh, as part and parcel of the Treaty of Versailles. You know, the Kaiser, gotta go, buddy and they established this democratic government, and it'll be the Weimar Republic that'll rule Germany from 1918 until 1933, when a nice young man, Austrian man, by the name of Adolf, um, moves into power. More about him later, but yeah, that's our first introduction to the Weimar Republic, and part of that was women could vote, which, of course, Uncle Adolf quietly resented. Even though women throughout Europe demanded the vote, but before World War I, only Norway could women vote in national elections. Okay, Jewish emancipation, the state of Jewry in Europe, also known as Zionism. And here's the funny thing, Mr. Arlinghouse. You know, I like to go, you know, I just put Zionism up on uh, in YouTube to search for it. And you get several different accountings of Zionism. Zionism, which takes the pro-Jewish slant, and Zionism that takes the opposite slant, that the Jews were invaders. You know, I mean, it's, you know, but I mean, that's the way history is written, is it not? So anyway, laws regarding the emancipation, the freedom of Jewry in Europe were always somewhat uncertain or often repealed with changes in the rules or with changes in the government. <clears throat> For example, in 1782, the Habsburg Emperor Joseph II had issued a decree that placed Jews in the Austrian Empire on a more or less equal footing with Christians. That's progress. In France, Jews were made citizens, 1789. During the Napoleonic Wars, Jews in Italy and Germany now, of course, you, when you say that Jews were made citizens in 1789, 
You also remember, Mr. Arlinghouse, that France is the country of the Dreyfus Affair. Yeah. So just because Jews made citizens does not mean that anti-Semitism had gone away. Far from it. During the Napoleonic era, Jews in Italy and Germany were allowed to mix on a notice in Germany. Yeah. Uh, now, Mr. Arlinghouse, there's going to be a question on the test that asks what country. In fact, I think it was a question on the last test. What country did Jews receive the worst treatment in the 19th century? Answer, not Germany. Russia. Russia. Not Germany. That comes later. But during the Napoleonic Wars, Jews in Italy and Germany were allowed to mix on a generally equal footing with the Christian population. Now, during the first half, and Mr. Arlinghouse, you know, I hate to give away the farm here, but there is a question on the test that refers to this factoid right here. And that is, during the, during, uh, the early part of the 19th century going forward, things for Jews in Europe, Western Europe, things for Jews in Western Europe, Got better and better and better until the last quarter of the century, the last 20 years or so. What happened? Uh, it's the economy, stupid. In 1873, there was a giant, I mean, it was basically the Great Depression of the 19th century. It was the worst economic depression until the Great Depression. And when those things happen, people tend to lash out, particularly at minorities. And Jews were made to feel unsafe again. And of course, there was the Dreyfus Affair. And so, yeah. So, during the first half of the 19th century, European Jews in Western Europe began to gain significant rights that brought them equal or nearly equal citizenship. Remember, once again, Benjamin Disraeli, the Prime Minister of Britain, the conservative Prime Minister of Britain, Jewish. In Russia and Russian Poland, though, Prejudice against Jews continued unabated until World War I. Look, Mr. Arlinghouse, Mr. Horton wrote that in all caps. Must mean it's important. Jews in Russia were treated as legal aliens. In other words, they had no citizenship and had no route to citizenship. And were unwelcome in Russia. Jews had to have internal passports. And Jews were banned from government work in Russia. This morning I asked my class what is a pogrom. They did not know. I wanted to punch many of them. Pogrom. Pogrom. It is a Russian word. I should make you all have to watch Fiddler on the Roof so you would know what the word meant. Because it's mentioned in Fiddler on the Roof. You all know Mr. Arlinghouse actually starred in Fiddler on the Roof. Yes. If I were a rich man, da, 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 you know, can you imagine, Mr. Arlinghouse? So, a pogrom is a Russian government sponsored killing of Jews. I mean, the government, you know, when things in Russia would go south, such as bad economy, such as failed harvest, such as famine, oh, Jews fall open season on the Jews. And they would, they would cut Jews to pieces attack Jewish villages. In fact, in the aforementioned movie, Fiddler on the Roof, the very last scene of Fiddler on the Roof, which is a musical comedy. Fiddler on the Roof is a musical comedy. But the way it ends, every Jew in that village in Russia are leaving because of a coming pogrom. They know and it's time to get out. And so they left. If I were a rich man, no. So, Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me. Mr. Arlinghouse, sing along if you like. After the revolutions of 1848, Jews saw a general improvement in their situation that lasted several decades. See, now, that's what you got to get, remember? Things got better, and then... In Germany, Italy, and also this morning, Mr. Arlinghouse, I asked my students, hey, what are the low countries? Is that where people live who are scum of the earth? No answer. Mr. Arlinghouse, he's, he just gave me a phone call, text. He said, Mr. Horton, the low countries are the Benelux countries. Well, what's that? Oh, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg. Well, why are they called the low countries? 
Elevation? Oh, okay. You mean the Netherlands? Part of the Netherlands is actually exists below sea level, and Belgium and the Nether and Luxembourg also are very low in elevation. Interesting, intriguing. So in Germany, Italy, the Low Countries, Scandinavia. So I have to ask, what Scandinavia is? What Finland? What? Sweden, what? Norway, that flag right there? Denmark? You mean the countries where the Vikings used to live? Jew in those countries, Jews attained full rights of citizenship. In Germany, boys and girls, Jews had full rights of citizenship. That's gonna go all the way through until once again our good friend Adolf in the uh, Nuremberg laws makes a slight change in that. After 1858, Jews in Britain could sit in Parliament. Austria-Hungary extended full rights to Jews in 1867. From 1850 to 1880, there was little organized or overt effort against Jewry. Jews freely intermarried with non-Jews, as legal secular prohibitions against such marriages had been repealed during the last quarter of the century. Outside of Russia, Jews aligned themselves with liberal parties. Later, however, they became associated with socialist parties. Hundreds of thousands of Jews migrated from Russia and Eastern Europe to Western Europe and the Americas where they faced less legal, legal prejudice. The newfound security of the Jewish began to dissipate during the last 20 years of the 19th century. That is going to be showing up on your test, Mr. Arlinghouse. Anti-Semitism raised up again during the economic stagnation, which began with the crash of 1873 and just kind of didn't go anywhere. Anti-Semitism, organized anti-Semitism rose during this time in Germany and in France during the Dreyfus Affair. This situation gave rise to Zionism. 1896, Theodore Herzl. Zionism, yes, <clears throat> and Zionism showed you that film, Mr. Arlinghouse, you now know what it is. Most Jewish leaders felt the attacks were merely temporary recurrences of old hatreds. Most Jewish leaders felt they'd be safe under the liberal legal protections that had been happening over the course of a century, and as you know, they were wrong, right? <clears throat> but we'll get to that later. labor, socialism, and politics to World War I. In all the industrializing countries, the proletariat. Please tell me what you, you know what the proletariat is, Mr. Arlinghouse. Please. It was a term, a Marxist term, but we use it now. It means the working class, a new class, the working class. Not the middle class, the working class, people who worked with their hands and earned wages as their way of living. Low skill, low pay, uh, but there was enough of them to form political movements, several of them. The numbers of skilled artisans declined as their type of work was being replaced by mechanization. Factory wage earners increased more and more. There are more factory workers. The numbers of people engaged in unskilled but manual laborers rose considerably. Although workers still had to depend upon themselves to prove their, improve their lot, after 1848, workers stopped riding in the streets to gain their ends. Workers turned to new methods to handle what they wanted to be done. No more riding the streets. They turned to trade unions, democratic political parties, and socialism. One such organization called trade unionism. The governments extended legal protection to unions during the second half of the century in Western Europe. Unions became fully legal in Great Britain in 1871 and could picket. That means strike, picket, strike, you know, <coughs> demand changes, refused to go to work in 1875. In France, Napoleon III had used force against strikers. 
but later had to negotiate with them in 1868, and they gained full legalization in 1884, after Napoleon III was dead and gone. Union participation in elections were minimal at first, as long as the representatives of the traditional governing classes, governing groups, governing political parties looked after their own interests. Members of the working class did not seek political parties. There were several labor strikes, but membership in trade unions, which did increase, never gained a majority of Europe's labor force. What the workers, the unions did represent for workers was a new collective form of association for confronting and improving their way of life. What the world does that mean, Mr. Horton? It means that these labor unions provided a way that workers could relatively peacefully enact change that they wanted. All right, Roman 21. Except for Russia, all major European states adopted, but you got to remember now, Poland is not a European state now. Half, I mean, most of the eastern half of Europe still belongs to either Austria or Russia. Uh, so, except for Russia, all the major European states adopted broad-based electoral systems, a.k.a. they voted in some way, shape, or form. The expansion of the voter base meant that politicians could no longer ignore the workers, and discontented groups could now voice their grievances and advocate their programs from within the government as they elected officials, rather than by rioting from the outside, and riots can be broken by soldiers. Sometimes, however, giving people the right to vote is not necessarily the best thing for society, because in this case, what you have in... Europe, what you have here is a new voting populace who are not exactly educated in the decision, the political decision making process. In other words, who knows? Maybe the founding fathers might have been on to something when they elected, when they uh, created the uh, Electoral College. Uh, because many of these voters in Europe. Uh, were not exactly educated, couldn't make good choices. So they, the organized political parties, were the movers of the election system. The largest single group in these mass electorates was the working class. The new electoral process gave the socialists now an opportunity to gain political power at the expense of the traditional ruling classes. Socialism, notice I wrote this in all caps, socialism as a political ideology opposed nationalism. Socialism, all right, let's go back over terms again. What is socialism? Oh, that's it right there. But it's socialism. I'll even leave some lines for you to write it on. Socialism is the idea that the government should take care of its populace. Nationalism. Nationalism is the idea that people of one country are innately superior to people of another country. And then all the things that go with that. Okay? Now I'll go back to the original statement. Socialism as a political ideology opposed nationalism. Socialists believe that they could unite workers from across boundaries. You see, and that was the thing. Socialism, broad base. Socialism wanted to unite people from every country. Karl Marx wanted to do that. He was he didn't call himself a socialist, but yeah. Socialism was an international movement. Of course, nationalism by its very nature is one country. 
Nationalism as a force in Europe was stronger than socialist desires and reforms. Although many workers had both nationalistic and socialistic ideologies, when World War I broke out, it was the nationalists who won out over socialism. The major question for late 19th century socialists throughout Europe was, pardon me, was whether meaningful change in a country could be brought about at the ballot box or through revolution. Karl Marx said, revolution is the only way. Marxism is a form of socialism, Mr. Arlinghouse. What the big difference about Marxism, though, is it advocates violent revolution, okay? The socialists were like, let's use the system and get the changes that we want. Democratic socialism, Bernie Sanders kind of socialism. Karl Marx and the First International. Karl Marx made considerable accommodations to the new practical realities that developed during the third quarter of the century. In other words, he made a few compromises that he didn't really like. In 1864, a group of British and French trade unionists founded the International Men's Association known as the First International. Original name, right? Yeah, I know. Its membership included socialists, anarchists, and Polish nationalists, amongst other radicals. Notice they include Polish nationalists with radicals. Because nationalism, you know, for a country like Poland was a pretty radical idea. Marx privately criticized the reform reformist works of the First International. The violence associated with the Paris Commune discredited the First International. For some reason, they thought it was the First uh, Paris Commune was a uh, was a uh, socialist movement. It was not. The last European Congress of the First International was held in 1973. It was then moved to the United States where it dissolved in 1976. The first international had a large and disproportionate effect on the course of future European socialism. Through the work of the first international Marxism, Marxism, violent upheaval, emerged as the single most important strand of socialism. The apparently scientific character of Marxism, I mean, Karl Marx was a historian, and we need to know about something, and we're going to call it uh, social Darwinism, which we'll talk about in a minute. Made it appealing during the later part of the age of reason and science. Better, shall we? What is social Darwinism? Social Darwinism is the idea that just like nature has created certain species to thrive, certain species to survive, and other species to be eliminated, human beings are like that, that certain human species, certain human ethnicities were selected by nature to thrive, others to simply exist, and others to be eliminated. That there were such a thing, there was such a thing as inferior races. Yes, Nazism is an offshoot of social Darwinism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You ever wonder where it came from, Mr. Darlinghouse? Now you have it. All right. Great Britain. Fabianism and early welfare programs. Mr. Arlinghouse, I want you to make note. Uh, look at those videos I attached to this uh, to this study guide, okay, or to this uh, assignment, uh, where Tom, what's his name? Tom Dewey? No. Tom Cheney? No. Tom Ritchie? Yes, Ritchie Rich. Tom Ritchie. Uh, where Tom Ritchie talks about Fabianism uh, and the early welfare programs. No brand of socialism made significant gains in Great Britain during this time. There. 
Trade unions here grew steadily and normally supported the liberal parties. Keir Hardy became the first independent working man to be elected to parliament. The small independent labor party in Great Britain remained ineffective. The House of Lords, through the Taft Vail decision, which is on your test, look it up. Yeah, look it up. Look it up. The Taft Vail decision removed the legal protection previously given to union funds. Trade unions, <clears throat> the trades union, formed the Labor Party in 1906 that sent 29 members. To the House of Par to uh, Parliament, they did not include socialism in their agenda. However, the Labour Party did become more militant. More and more uh, strikes, railway strikes, dock strikes, coal mining strikes. British socialism became the territory of the Fabian Society. Now, I was listening to my good friend um, Tom Ritchie, and he talked about the Fabians. Um, the Fabian movement. The Fabian Society was founded in 1884 and was Britain's most influential socialist group. The name came from Fabius Maximus, who fought Hannibal using what are called Fabian tactics, avoiding direct confrontation with Hannibal that would lead to defeat, but only take the little victories that they could, do delaying tactics, do things to harass them. And so, yeah, they became known as the Fabians. The name reflected a gradual approach to socialist reform. So let me get rid of this. And cut. So the Fabians included Sidney Webb and Beatrice Webb, famous authors, H.G. Wells. Do you know who H.G. Wells is? Miss Darling House. H.G. Wells wrote science fiction. War of the Worlds. He wrote War of the Worlds, yes. And he also wrote The Time Machine. Good books. Uh, they were Fabians. Graham Wallace, another writer, and George Bernard Shaw, also a writer. Many Fabians were civil servants who believed that the problems of the working class could be solved gradually, peacefully, and democratically. They were particularly interested in collective ownership of the municipal industries. That means the government should own things like uh, the gas company, the water company, the railroads. This was called gas and water socialism. In 1903, Joseph Chamberlain launched his campaign to match high foreign tariffs and pay for socialist reforms through higher import duties. In 1903, David Lloyd George, a name, uh, he will be the Prime Minister of Great Britain at the end of World War I. I'm sure Mr. Arlinghouse is going like this. I know him. I know him. At that point in time, he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, David Lloyd George, the Liberal Government of Britain, began to initiate a broad program of social legislation. That included the establishment of labor exchanges. We call it today. We call it today. Collective bargaining, where the leadership of labor sits down with the leadership of management and they talk and they have uh, a mediator who comes in and says, yeah, you need to give that and you need to give that and let's go back to work. Regulation of certain trades. I don't know what that has to do with anything. Let's get rid of that. And the National Insurance Act of 1911. This is big. Unemployment. The British started unemployment in 1911. Unemployment benefits and health care. Um, this country will not have unemployment until Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Many of the reforms that Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Mr. Arlinghouse, put into the New Deal were first found in Europe, Britain, particularly. Because this conflict between the House of Commons, the Liberals, and the House of Lords Conservatives resulted in the passage of the Parliament Act of 1911. This 
Act effectively allowed, Mr. Allinghouse, the House of Commons, House of C, the House of Commons, which was the lower house, the House of Commons, that represented the great majority of the British population, versus the House of Lords, who only represented members of the nobility, the old nobility. This act of 1911 effectively allowed the House of Commons to overrule the House of Lords. This meant that Britain more and more was taking an expanded role in the lives of its citizenry. Socialism. Yeah, socialism. We're going to begin on Thursday with here at Roman numeral 24. And we're getting close to the end of this unit, Mr. Arlinghouse. That could be bad because it could be another test, which I've already finished. Uh, but we need to press on. But I'm going to shut it down for the day. Have a good day.